want nothing to do with God, you want to deny Him, there is a place prepared that has nothing to do with Him. God gives man a choice because that's what love does. It gives a choice. He is the only way. There is no other way. I don't care what you were raised with. Jesus, there's one way. I share an experience I had on November 23rd, 1998 that forever changed my life. It doesn't matter if you believe my experience. What matters is that you check out what God has to say about hell and avoid it just the same. God chose a man like this to take him there to come back and tell us about it because he's got no reason. He's got no agenda. He's got no reason to make up stories. And when you hear it tonight, you'll realize this is real. God bless you. Well, we are so blessed to be back in Johannesburg, South Africa. Praise the Lord. I'm excited. And to be a Christian family church. Pastor Theo and Bev, we love you with all our heart. And we thank you so much for having us here. We're so honored. You know, it's interesting. If most of us go on a vacation... We check out the sites, the hotels, the restaurants. We do some investigation. But yet most people do no investigation on where they're going to go after they die. They put a great deal of effort into a short holiday and no effort into eternity. Why is that? I believe it's because most people tend to believe whatever they're raised with and not question it. But not questioning something, you can remain ignorant or uninformed. And you could be on the wrong path. The wisest man that ever lived was King Solomon, except for Jesus. And he said in Proverbs 14, 12, There is a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. So if you're here tonight and you're not familiar with the Bible and you don't call yourself a Christian, we're here to share with you some information that will enable you to make an informed decision. So we just ask that you simply remain open and listen. Mark Twain even said, We're all ignorant and just about different things. And another wise man in our world today is uh, Dr. Chuck Missler, a Bible teacher. And he said, the only sure barrier to truth is to assume you already have it. So if you can remain open. And this is not a message of condemnation. This is simply a message of warning. You know, what loving parent wouldn't warn their child not to play in a busy street? Eleven years ago, November 23rd, 1998, this experience happened. And when it first occurred, I didn't really want to share it with anyone. I'm a conservative person by nature, and to be identified with something seemingly as wild as saying you've been to hell was very uncomfortable for me. You know, you usually picture someone, you know, with wild hair and a wooden sign standing on a street corner screaming, you're going to burn, you know, and that's what I envisioned, so I didn't want to be identified with that. I shared it with one close friend two weeks later and my parents. Well, the close friend asked us to come to their Bible study and share it. Well, three months later, I went reluctantly and shared it. Well, we began getting invited to different Bible studies and then churches and then some television and radio. So it started spreading. For the next seven years, my wife and I would take her two days off a week and her vacation time, and we would travel around the country wherever we were invited. And uh, we did this for seven years. We paid our own way everywhere, and we never took one dime from anybody during that time. This was prior to the book coming out. And then about four and a half years ago, the publisher came to us and they asked us to write the book. So it was not something we wanted to self-promote. But I was happy to do the book because I really wanted to put in there the Word of God. So we have over 150 verses in our first book and 250 verses in our second book that, will, that tell you everything I saw is already in the Bible. And so if you're here tonight and you say, Bill, I don't know if I believe you, you know. Well, I'm not here to convince you to believe me or to espouse to my experience. What I'm here to do is to convince you to believe the Word of God. That's all that matters. It's not important to believe me, but that's why we put all those verses in the Bible. And I'll quote some of them along the way, but I can't give them all because of time constraints and so forth. But that's what's important for all of us to believe. You might ask, Bill, how do you know this wasn't just a bad dream? Well, three reasons, but just to give you one quickly. On the way back from this experience, I had viewed my body lying on the floor. This was not a near-death experience. This was an out-of-body experience that comes under the classification of a vision in the Bible. You remember in 2 Corinthians 12, 1 and 2, when Paul was caught up into heaven in a vision. He said whether in the body or out of the body, he didn't know. Well, the Lord just happened to show me that I left my body. So that's how I know it wasn't just a bad dream. There was two other reasons, but that was the first reason. And 
on the way back, I was traveling back with the Lord, which I will tell you about. But 1 John 4.18 says, perfect love casts out fear. So I had no fear whatsoever being with the Lord. But when he left and I came back into my body, the memories and thoughts of hell flooded back into my mind. And I immediately started screaming. And my body, I felt, was dying. You cannot even live in this body with the memories of hell. It is that severe. You will literally die of fright. And I started screaming, and I went into a traumatized state. And my screams woke up my wife. So I wanted her to share with you how she found me. Certainly. This happened November 1998, and Bill and I had been Christians for quite a while. We never studied the topic of hell. We never entertained dark movies. We actually only thought about hell as this is a place that's hot, and we were glad we weren't going there as Christians. We went to bed. It was a Sunday night. We had a prayer meeting, and we went to sleep. It was about 11, 11.30. And I woke to screams coming from our living room. And the first thing I did is I looked at our digital clock, which read 3.23. Now, Bill had gotten up in the middle of the night. It was 3 a.m., and that's where the 23 minutes in hell comes from. And I proceeded down the hallway, and I found my husband in a state that I have never, ever seen him in. Anyone who knows Bill knows he is calm, conservative. He has a very peaceful nature. So to see him in this state was extremely shocking. And he began to scream and cry out. Pray for me, pray for me, the Lord has taken me to hell. And I know it sounds strange, but when he said that, I actually felt a peace inside because I knew he wasn't having a heart attack or physically dying. And I began to pray for him. And the Lord very, very graciously took, a, took away the horror and the fear from his mind, but left the memory of what had happened so he could share his story. Give him hell, honey. My wife is even more beautiful on the inside, so I'm a blessed man. I married way over my head, but praise God. God is still in the miracle business. Amen. I know I can't see anybody, but anyway. I just want to explain a couple things before I get into what happened. Um, a few questions you might have. Some people said, Bill, what about uh, in Luke 16, the rich man said to Abraham, could you send back Lazarus to warn my brothers of this place? And Abraham said, even if one came back from the dead, they would not be persuaded. So Bill, why would God send you? I've been asked that question. Well, two reasons I don't fit that scenario. Number one, I wasn't dead. So I'm not coming back from the dead. This was a vision. And number two, I'm not telling anyone to look at me and be persuaded. I'm just a signpost to point people to the scriptures. Okay, and number two, how can a Christian see hell? Only in a vision can a Christian see hell. And if you remember in Ezekiel chapter 8 and chapter 3, Ezekiel had a vision where he was picked up by his hair and he was carried to Jerusalem. He was told to eat. It became bitter in his stomach. He wept. He conversed. He was told to dig through a wall. My point in bringing those things out is in a vision, you can experience the same things that you could in your physical body. So in a vision, you can enter into a spirit body. 1 Corinthians 15, talks about a natural body and a spirit body. And just like he ate and it became bitter in his stomach. The same with John in Revelation 5, 5 and 10, 10, he was cut up into heaven. So you can travel in a vision also. Genesis 15, 5, Abraham was brought forth abroad. And many other examples I could give you. So you can travel and it's just as real as it would be in your physical body. And in Job 7, 14, it says, you scare me with dreams and terrify me through visions. You can have a terrifying vision. Isaiah 21.2, he was given a grievous vision. And in Job 4.14, Eliphaz was given a vision that caused his bones to shake. So you can have a grievous, terrifying, bone-shaking vision. Okay, so this was at least one of those. <laughs> so uh, you might ask Bill, but I'm, not, I'm a Christian, I'm not going to hell. Why do I need to hear about it? And I just want to give you quickly three reasons. Number one, when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be much more appreciative of your own salvation from what you were saved from. Many Christians have, you know, in churches today have downplayed the topic of hell and, and said, well, it's not really a place of torment. It's not really a geographical location. It's maybe just a state of the mind. It's maybe just separation from God, as if that wasn't a big deal, which we'll find out it is. And, um, and a lot of Christians even believe in annihilationism, a teaching that says that if you deny Jesus, when you die, you simply cease to exist. Well, that is not true. We have many Christians that write us and tell us that. 
And uh, it's just wrong teaching. But Jesus said, remember Matthew 25, 46, these shall go into everlasting life and these shall go into everlasting punishment. He used the same word, Ionios, for everlasting. So just as heaven is eternal, so is hell. And he said the same thing in John 5, 29, Mark 16, 16, Daniel 12, 2 explains that. But just to give you two more scriptures, there's about 30 I could give you, but uh, two that prove there is not annihilationism is Revelation 20, 13 through 15 and Revelation 14, 10 and 11. And no time to really read all those, but you can check those out and that absolutely re refutes annihilationism. So you will be much more appreciative though of what you were saved out of. So thankful that we don't have to go to this place. Number two, it will cause you to walk, walk more in the fear of the Lord. You know, there's a lack of the fear of the Lord in the church today. You know, many Christians live compromised lifestyles. They live in sin and they feel comfortable living in sin because there's a lack of the fear of the Lord. And Psalms 89, 7 says, God is greatly to be feared in the assembly of the saints. And the word feared there is the word eris. It means to shake in terror. So how many of us really shake in terror over the Lord? And Moses, he shook and quaked exceedingly and he was called the friend of God. So how much more us? You say, but Bill, what about, you know, crying out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Father. Yes, we are to get to be able to call that out and call Daddy, Father. But first, we have to have a healthy, reverential fear of Almighty God. Because God hates sin, and there is a punishment coming on sin. And to live in sin and compromised, you should not be, feel comfortable doing that. Mark 9, 47, Jesus said, if your eye offends thee, the word offend means to cause you to sin. He said, pluck it out. It's better for you to enter into life maimed than into hell fire. Jeremiah 32, 40 says, I will put my fear in their hearts that they will not depart from me. So the fear of the Lord will keep you walking that straight walk. You will not want to walk the edge. You know, some people want to live right on the edge, on the fence of sin. You want to be so far away from that fence and walking in holiness and straight before God when you understand how fearful and horrific hell is. And so that's the second reason. The third reason is it'll give you a much greater passion to witness. Bill Bright said only 2% of Christians even bother to witness. Now, Charles Spurgeon said that 90% of our witness is through our life example. How, do we keep our word? Do we show up on time? Do we work with excellence? Do we show forgiveness? Do we show love? All those things people observe. That's 90% of our witness. But also we are to open up our mouths and share the gospel. But most people don't open their mouths and share the gospel. And in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 10, and 11, Paul said, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. So when in that scripture, even though it's talking about the judgment seat, the reward seat for Christians, most all the commentaries agree that it's also talking about judgment and hell in general. So when you understand how severe hell is, you'll be more persuasive with men. You'll want to persuade men. And Ezekiel 33, 8 says, if we fail to speak to warn the sinner from his way, his blood will I require at your hand. That's a strong scripture. God holds us accountable if we don't open our mouths. And it says the same thing in Acts 20, 26 and Acts 18, 6. Colossians 1, 28 says, Christ in you, the hope of glory, whom we preach, warning every man. We're to warn every man. That's why Paul said, woe is me if I preach not the gospel. So those are three quick reasons why it's important for us as Christians to understand hell and how severe it is so we can warn people. And one more thing that was unique about this vision, God hid it from my mind that I was a Christian. You know, I've been a Christian 39 years. This happened 11 years ago. He blocked it from my mind that I was saved. You say, Bill, where's that in the Bible? Luke 24, 16, where Jesus appeared to the uh, disciples on the road to Emmaus. It says, their eyes were holden that they should not know him. John MacArthur's commentary says they were kept by God from recognizing him. God hid it from their mind. Same thing in John 20, 14, Luke 18, 34, Daniel 4, 34, 2 Kings 4, 27. These are all examples where God hid something from someone's mind for a purpose, and he did from mine for a reason, which I will get to. Okay? And um, all right. We went to a prayer meeting, came home, like my wife said, Sunday night, went to bed. Nothing unusual about the night. I've never had a vision before. Like my wife said, we've never entertain dark movies, none of that. And I went to bed at three o'clock in the morning. I mean, I got up at three o'clock in the morning and suddenly I was pulled out of my body and I found myself falling through the air and I landed in a prison cell in hell. I had no explanation of how I got there, why I was there. I was fully awake and cognizant, just like I'm standing here now, it was that just as real. And this prison cell 
was filthy, stinking, dirty, smoke-filled, rough-hewn stone walls and bars. Isaiah 24, 22 says, And they shall be gathered together as prisoners are gathered in the pit and shall be shut up in the prison. Proverbs 7, 27 mentions going down to hell to the chambers of death. The word chambers means inner rooms. Job 17, 16 says, They shall go down to the bars of the pit. And Jonah 2, 6 says, The earth with her bars was about me forever. And it's talking about literal gates and bars. According to Tyndale, the New International Commentary, and many other respected commentaries, it's actually talking about bars and gates. So that's where I found myself in this stinking prison cell and the first thing I noticed was a tremendous heat I wondered how can I be alive I should be incinerated already it was so unbearably hot but yet here I was alive I was lying face down on this stone floor and I noticed I couldn't hardly move I tried to move and it took so much effort to even move I thought what's wrong with my body why can't I move but see, Isaiah 14, 9 and 10 says, Hell from beneath is moved to meet thee at thy coming. They will say, Art thou become weak as we? And the word weak there is the word ill or faint, the same word used in Judges 16, 7, where Samson became weak when they cut off his hair. And Psalms 88, 4 says, I am counted with them that go down into the pit. I am as a man that has no strength. So one of the things you have to endure for all eternity is you are completely void of any kind of strength. Now that might not sound like a big deal, but really, if you ever thought about, remember a time when you had the flu? and you just felt weak from the flu? Well, it's a thousand times worse than that. Any movement takes so much effort. But see, Acts 17, 28 says, in Him we live and move and have our being. Even movement comes from God. It's not automatic. I looked up and I saw these two enormous beasts in the cell. I didn't realize what they were yet. They were demons. But they were uh, reptilish in appearance, bumps and scales all over the one's body huge jaw, sunken in eyes, uh, claws about a foot long, and these particular two were about 12 or 13 feet tall. And that sounds like an exaggeration, but I could give you scripture for that too, but I have to keep moving. And these two were pacing in the cell like a caged animal, the most ferocious, vicious demeanor of anything you've ever seen. And they were blaspheming and cursing God. They had an extreme hatred for God. And we know hatred comes from the demonic realm. Revelation 13, 6, James 2, 7. And uh, as they were cursing and blaspheming God, the one picked me up and threw me into the wall like I weighed the weight of a water glass. Tremendous strength. I hit the wall. Bones broke. I collapsed on the floor. I felt pain. But I understood that I only felt a small amount of the pain. The Lord explained on the way back that He blocked almost all the pain, but He did allow me to feel some of it so that I can relate to people. It's not metaphorical or allegorical pain. It's real literal pain you're going to feel in hell. And the amount I felt was enough. And the other one picked me up and dug its claws into my chest and just tore the flesh open. It hung like ribbons. I couldn't believe, how could I be alive? I should be dead from these wounds. But yet here I was, alive. You have a body. Matthew 10, 28 says, Fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. I remember Luke 16, the rich man. He had a tongue. He had eyes. He thirsted. But I noticed there was no blood or water coming from the wounds. And just something I happened to notice. But we know Leviticus 17, 11 says the life of the flesh is in the blood. Well, there's no life in hell, so there's no blood. And Zechariah 9, 11 says, Thy prisoners out of the pit where there is no water. There's not one drop of water in hell. They had absolutely no mercy. None. They had this extreme hatred. And we know Psalms 103, 17 says, The mercy of the Lord is upon those that fear him. Well, they don't fear him in hell, so you don't derive that benefit of mercy. Two more walked in, and uh, one of them crushed my head like flat. And I couldn't believe, how could I be alive through this? But you can't die. And I, I didn't see the two as they walked in, because right about that moment, it went dark. Now, I believed it resumed its normal state, and, but it was God's presence was there in the form of light for me to see, to describe to you what it looked like but then it resumed its normal state of absolute pitch black darkness. I mean, it was so dark. Lamentations 3, 6 says, He has set me in dark places as they that be dead of old. And Jude 13 talks about blackness of darkness forever. But it's not just dark, like here in the dark. You can feel the darkness, and that's not an exaggeration. Exodus 10, 21 talks about a darkness that may be felt. It would just penetrate right through every cell in your body because it's such evil in this place. Total evil, no love of any kind. 
And all four of them then grabbed an arm and a leg and were gonna pull my arms and legs off. And I thought, I can't, I can't endure this. And something right at that moment grabbed me and pulled me out of the cell. Now it was God, but I didn't realize that then. And placed me over next to this pit of fire, this raging pit of fire that was about a mile across, enormous pit with flames raging high up into this open cavern. And it was brimstone falling and uh, like lava falling from, from above. And this is where I could first see people. I, could, I was listening to the screams all this time. It is so loud and deafening in hell. I mean, the screams. You ever, ever heard someone scream, an agonizing scream? Well, it's terrible to hear that. Well, there's millions of people screaming, and it, it just penetrates you again. Isaiah 57, 21 says, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. You have no peace of mind whatsoever. And I looked through the flames, and this is where I could first see people. There were people literally inside this pit, in the flames burning. And it was not metaphorical or allegorical fire. It was real, literal fire. Psalms 11:6 6 says, Upon the wicked he will rain snares, fire, and brimstone, and a horrible tempest. Psalms 140, verse 10 says, Let burning coals fall upon them. Let them be cast into the fire, into deep pits. Matthew 13, 49 says, The angels shall sever the wicked from the just and cast the wicked into a furnace of fire. John 15, 6, many other scriptures I could give you, but it's real literal fire. And just to give you one verse to prove to you it's fire, in Revelation 9, 2, during the tribulation time on the earth here, when the bottomless pit is opened, it says there arose a smoke, and our air and sky were darkened by reason of the smoke of the pit. Well, it couldn't have been a metaphor or a metaphorical fire to produce real smoke. It takes a real fire to produce real smoke to darken our sky, you see. And in Luke 16, he wanted a drop of water to cool his tongue. So if it, if it was just flames of mental anguish, why would water suffice? If you remember the Twin Towers, when people jumped, you remember how awful that would have been to jump out of those towers. And they said that the temperature of the burning fuel was 2,000 degrees, which is, I think, uh, about 1,100 degrees uh, Celsius, and that they would be incinerated in 15 seconds facing that heat. So those people chose to jump rather than face 15 seconds of fire. And scientists say that the center of the earth is 12,000 degrees. And that's why Jesus warned. You know, there's 46 verses in the Bible where Jesus talked about hell. And 18 of those verses are about the fire of hell. You see, so that's why he warned us. This place is real. It's severe. And uh, I, I, I knew, I understood that I was down deep in the earth. I just understood that, but there's 49 verses that talk about where hell is currently located. I'll just give you two, Ezekiel 26, 20, Numbers 16, 32, and 33. But there's 49 verses, and I just understood that I was down deep in the earth. Now, after Judgment Day, death and hell are delivered up and cast into the lake of fire, Revelation 20, 13, and into outer darkness, Matthew 25, 30. But down deep in the earth, I understood that there were different levels of torment. I don't know what level I was in, but I understood there were different degrees of punishment and levels of torment. Now, you remember Jesus said, you shall receive the greater damnation, Matthew 23, 14, inferring there's a lesser. Or he said, it shall be more tolerable for Sodom and Gomorrah in a day of judgment than for that city, inferring there's a less tolerable. Or Hebrews 10, 28 says, of how much worse of a punishment supposed to be for you, you who have trodden underfoot the Son of God. Luke 12, 47 talks about beaten with many stripes or beaten with you. Anyway, the point is, there is no comfortable, nice level in hell. They're all horrendous beyond anything you can ever imagine. I was so thirsty. Just a drop of water would have been so precious like the rich man. I felt like if you were to imagine running through the Sahara Desert for a month with cotton in your mouth, I desperately wanted a drop of water. But you never get that drop. I, um, the smells in hell are so foul and putrid and disgusting worse than anything you can ever imagine. Like uh, the worst open sewer, bad eggs, rotten milk, everything, again, times a thousand, but also add to it sulfur, and sulfur is actually toxic to breathe. If you go to Hawaii, to the volcano, they have signs posted where you can't go past a certain point because the toxicity coming up from the volcano, the sulfur will kill you. Well, that's what you're breathing in hell. And you know, uh, I learned this from John Bevere, but he sa said that, um, Man can adjust to any kind of odor, any kind of foul odor man can adjust to, but he cannot adjust to sulfur. 
you cannot adjust to that smell. It is so foul and pungent, pungent, um, putrid and disgusting. And this is what you're breathing in hell. And remember, Jesus rebuked the foul spirits, Mark 9, 25. Uh, it is so foul and putrid. But it's, it's worse than that because you don't really want to breathe the air anyway. I mean, it's so foul, but you can't because there's not enough oxygen to breathe. Like here, we take a nice deep breath. Well, you, you don't have enough air to breathe in hell. You have to fight and gasp for even the tiniest bit of air. And maybe only an asthma patient can relate to this, but I'll demonstrate to you. This is how you breathe in hell. It was like... And that's as much air as you could get. So any moment you felt like, I'm going to die. I don't have enough oxygen. But you keep going. But see, Isaiah 42.5 says, The Lord gives breath to the people upon the earth. You're not upon the earth. You're down beneath the earth. God's real specific with His Word. So you don't derive that benefit again. Uh, you need to sleep in hell. Like here we need sleep, right? Well, you know, I was only there 23 minutes, but I felt like I was there 23 weeks. And I understood that you need to go to sleep. I wanted to go to sleep. I was so exhausted. But you can't ever go to sleep again. Can you imagine staying up? You've been up one or two nights, and you know how you feel. But for all eternity, you never get to go to sleep. Revelation 14, 11 says, And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Now, that primarily means no rest from the torments, but no rest of any kind. Because Isaiah 57, 20 says, The wicked are like the troubled sea that cannot rest. But see, again, that's a blessing and benefit from God because Psalms 127, 2 says, The Lord gives His beloved sleep. You're not His beloved there. You're hungry. You never get to eat. You never get to drink. You're in total darkness. The fear level, everything you have to experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. I was standing by this big pit of fire and I was observing all these people burning and you know, you feel so helpless. You can't help yourself. You have, it's a useless wasting away. You have no purpose, no destiny. Ecclesiastes 9.10 says, there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in Sheol. It's just a complete useless wasting away. And it doesn't matter who you are. If you're somebody famous here, no one would know who you are there. You're completely lost and alone. Ecclesiastes 6.4 says your name is covered in darkness. So no one would know who you are. And you're forgotten in hell. Psalms 88.12, Isaiah 26.14, no one would remember you in hell. And it's confusion and turmoil in hell. It's just everything is confusion. You know, we like things in order here and neat and order. Well, hell's the opposite. Jeremiah 20, 11, and Isaiah 45, 16 talk about everlasting confusion. And Job 10, 22 talks about a land without any order. These are all the things that, that hell's like. And as I was looking at this pit, there were individual pits of fire all around this big pit with people inside their individual pits. Some were in the big pit, some were in individual pits. I can't explain that. Psalms 94, 13 talks about pits. And uh, flames would come up and just burn the flesh off. And there were just skeleton forms of people with flesh just hanging off. Psalms 49, 14 talk, explains that also. But um, as I was looking at these people, and all around me was this tunnel. I was standing beneath this tunnel. And there were demonic creatures of all sizes and shapes in this tunnel. Uh, some were two and three feet tall. Uh, some looked like spiders. And they were three and four feet across. I mean, I don't like spiders, but three and four feet across. And there were snakes of all sizes and shapes. Some of the demons were 12 and 13 feet tall. Uh, there were maggots everywhere. Millions of maggots crawling. I could only see a little bit from the light from the flames, but it illuminated enough for me to see the ground that was covered solid with maggots. And you know, I learned this from John MacArthur's teaching on hell. But um, you know, first of all, Isaiah 14, 11 says, where the maggot will be spread under thee and will cover thee. It uses the word maggot in the original. John MacArthur said that, you know, if an animal, a dead animal, I know this is disgusting, but just bear with me. If a dead animal is being eaten by maggots, well, when the flesh is consumed, the maggots will die. And I never knew that, but when the flesh is fully consumed, the maggots will die. Well, that's why Jesus said, where their worm dies not and the fire is not quenched. It's also the word maggot. You see, so in other words, the flesh is never fully consumed, so the maggot feeds sweetly on thee, as it says in Job 24.20. I mean, is that disgusting enough? The fear level that you have to experience in hell is so far beyond anything you can imagine. You know, and I'll relate to an experience that I had. 
I used to surf when I was 16 uh, a lot, and I was surfing off the coast of Cocoa Beach, Florida. A bunch of guys were out, and a shark came by and grabbed the guy next to me and ripped his leg off. And the shark came back. There was about 30 sharks probably, and 100 guys out. We were scrambling, trying to get to the beach. And the shark passed by me, and I got up on my knees, and I was on a nine-foot board. And the shark was longer than my board. And the paper said they were tiger sharks. You know anything about sharks? They're really vicious. And the shark passed by, turned his head, and I saw his teeth were about this long, and his mouth was about that wide. And he passed by, and he came back, and he bit my board in half. Now I was in the water, and I was with a friend of mine, Renee, and Renee was also in the water, and, you know, Renee just said to me, I guess we're dead. That's a bad confession, for sure, but, but I mean, that's how you felt. Anyway, the shark came back and grabbed my leg and pulled me down under the water. Now you can imagine the fear that I felt, right? Well, that fear paled in comparison to what you feel in hell. That wouldn't even register. You know, Psalm 73, 18 and 19 says, you cast them down into destruction where they are utterly consumed with terrors. Anyway, the shark let me go. Praise God. That's a miracle of God, right? Let me go. I mean, open its mouth and I didn't even have a mark in my leg. Can you imagine? That's a miracle of God. Not one mark, and that's impossible with any shark, but especially a tiger shark. God was watching over me. You know, and I was not even a Christian then. But I got saved immediately after that. So, <laughs> that's God. That's God. Thank you, Lord. You would too, right? I thought about my wife. You know, my wife and I were really close, and I thought about her, and I knew I would never get out. I would never see her again. I could never talk to her again. She would never know where I was at even. And for all eternity, can you imagine living with that thought alone that she'll never know where I'm at and I can't even tell her? That alone was extremely tormenting for me, and it would be for any of you. You never get to see your loved ones. Even though you saw people all in that pit of fire all close together, it's not like that in reality. You're all kept apart and isolated. So you don't get the pleasure of being next to a person even and having conversation. You see, there's pleasure in being with somebody, right? And having conversation. You don't get to do that in hell. You're kept in the dark and isolated for all eternity. I mean, can you imagine all this? And maggots feeding on you and all the things that you have to endure. Any one of these things you should die from. But you keep living because our soul is eternal. God made us in his image so our soul can't die. It lives on for eternity no matter what you do to it. And, uh, you know, you might say, but Bill, why is hell so horrible? Well, I want to explain something. First of all, Matthew 25, 41, uh, Jesus said that hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. Well, the word prepared there is the same word he used in John 14, 2, where he goes to prepare a place for us in heaven. And in that preparation, what God did was he withdrew his attributes from hell. You see, James 1, 17 said, every good and perfect gift comes down from above, from the Father of lights. So God prepared a place. He just withdrew his attributes. Because, see, hell is dark because 1 John 1, 5 says God is light. There's only death in hell because John 1, 4 said God is life. There's only hatred in hell because 1 John 4, 16 said God is love. There's no mercy in hell because Psalms 36, 5 said the mercy of the Lord is in the heavens. There's no strength in hell because Psalms 18, 32 said the Lord gives us strength. There's no water in hell because Psalms 18, uh, Deuteronomy 11, 11 says water is the rain of heaven. And there's no peace in hell because Isaiah 9, 6 says he is the prince of peace. So you see, remove God from the situation or he removes himself and all the good goes with him. There is no good thing apart from God. So to think you can enjoy fresh air, sunshine, uh, comfort, uh, conversation with people, food. No, all that comes from God. Because Psalms 33, 5 said, the earth is full of the goodness of the Lord. So we get to enjoy God's goodness when we're here on the earth. But if you want nothing to do with God, you want to deny him, there is a place prepared that has nothing to do with him other than one thing. His wrath is poured out in the form of fire because God hates sin, so he pours out his wrath and that's the fire in hell is his wrath. Revelation 14, 10 says so. Uh, Jude 7, 
Deuteronomy 32, 22, uh, Isaiah 33, 14. Uh, I could go on, but uh, his wrath, that's the fire of God. So, but hell is horrible because God has withdrawn his attributes from that place. And so when people look at the green tree, the water, the sky, and they say, oh, isn't Mother Nature wonderful? No, that's not Mother Nature. That's Father God that provided that. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, Lord. So that's why hell is so horrendous, because God's goodness does not exist there. As I was viewing all this in this tunnel, I began being raised up this tunnel. And suddenly, all of a sudden, this bright light showed up. I knew immediately who it was. I didn't have to ask. And I just said, Jesus. And he said, I am. It was a bright light like I've never seen a light like this before. I only saw the outline of a man. I didn't see his face. And when he said, I am, I just fell at his feet. And I felt like I died. I can only explain that through Revelation 1.16, where John, when he saw him, it says his countenance was bright as the sun. And I fell at his feet as one dead. So I don't know if I died or what happened, but he touched me and I came to. And I was at his feet. And it was there that I realized even though I've known this all my years as a Christian, but it really hit me so strongly that because he went to the cross, I didn't have to go to that place. I was so grateful for the cross. If he wouldn't have gone, all of us would be there. Every one of us. I was so thankful. All I wanted to do was say, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I didn't want to ask him any questions. I just wanted to worship him. But thoughts started coming in my mind after a time, and he would answer my thoughts. Psalms 139, 2 says, he answers our thoughts afar so off. And I thought, Lord, why did you send me to this horrible place? And he said, because many people do not believe hell is real. He said, even some of my own people do not believe hell exists. And I thought, don't all Christians believe in hell? But they don't. A lot of Christians are even misled. And he wanted me to go and tell people because a lot of the churches aren't teaching the truth about hell. And he doesn't want anybody to go there. He didn't make it for man, like Pastor said. Matthew 25, 41. Hell was prepared for the devil and his angels. But man will go there if he chooses to reject the only provision for our sin, which is Jesus Christ. I thought, Lord, why did those demons hate me so much? He said, because you're made in my image and they hate me. Remember John 15, 18, Jesus said they hated me before they hated you. And we're made in God's image, Genesis 1, Those demons hate you. All the evil we see in the world today, sickness, disease, cancer, all that, that all comes from the demonic realm. I was so aware of that when I was in hell. I looked at those demons and I, that's where cancer and all this comes from. It's not from God. People blame God falsely. Jesus said, I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. Satan has come to kill, steal, and destroy. That's where the evil comes from on the earth, not from God. He's the giver of life. And I thought, Lord, why didn't you pick me? He didn't give me an answer. So I have no idea why he would have picked me. You know, I was not a... Billy Graham. I just was a realtor going to work like everybody else every day. You know, and I, I like everything neat and clean and perfect and hell is the antithesis. You know, I know we all do, but I'm like a fanatic about these things. And, and um, I mean, I don't even like the summertime. That's too hot for me, you know. But I don't, it doesn't matter why he picked me. You know, he's given us all a job to do. Everyone has a job to do for the Lord. And no one is more important than anybody else. We're all equally as important. And you know, I was uncomfortable for seven years given this testimony, extremely uncomfortable. And I complained and the Lord said to me, Bill, it's not about you being comfortable. It's about you being obedient. If we will be obedient, we'll become comfortable. And now it doesn't matter what anybody thinks of me. 
If one person can get saved and not go to this place, just one, it's worth it all. Amen? I said, Lord, I don't want to tell anybody about this experience. They're going to think I'm crazy or had a bad dream. And he said, it's not your job to convict their hearts. It's the Holy Spirit's job. You just go and tell them. I said, yes, sir, I'll go. Whatever you want. And we kept ascending up this tunnel. And I said, Lord, why didn't I know you? Why didn't I know you? And he said, because if you would have known me, you would have had hope. And I wanted you to experience what they feel there, hopelessness. You see, if I was there as a Christian like I am, then I would have said, praise God, he's getting me out of here, right? I would have known I would not have to have stayed there. But he blocked it from my mind so that I could experience what those people feel, hopeless, hopelessness for all eternity. Isaiah 38, 18 says, those who go down to the pit cannot hope for thy truth. And we know the truth is Jesus. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. Well, those people, Jesus is the only hope for us. And they have no hope for him. He's the only hope. They have no hope. It's too late for them. The decision's final. So that was really the worst part of hell, besides the pain and, and being separated from God and all his goodness, was to know that you'll never, ever get out 10 million years will go by and you're still there suffering. And we went out into space, all the way out into space. And I look back at the earth and it was like, like you would look at the earth, like a globe. It was so awesome to see the earth from space. I mean, it was absolutely glorious. I look back and I said, wow, what's, what's holding that up? You know, Job 26, seven says, he hangeth the earth upon nothing. I was like, what's holding it up? What's making it turn so perfectly at a thousand miles an hour and not varying even one mile per hour? All these thoughts were going through my mind. I'm just sharing with you what was in my mind. It was so beautiful to see the earth. I don't know how you could not get saved by seeing God's creation from space. And you know, when I was a child, I wanted to be an astronaut. And I believe God remembered that thought. And he says, he'll give us the desires of our heart. I mean, how, how great is that? You know, he didn't have to take the scenic route home, you know, but he did that for me. So how much more will he give us all the desires of our heart if we serve him? As I was looking at the earth, I looked out at space and God allowed me to experience a little bit more of his power. And Numbers 12, 6 says he reveals himself in a vision and speaks in a dream. He revealed to me just a piece more of what we can grasp here of his awesome power. And I looked out at space and I could see all the vastness of the universe, the stars, the billions of stars. And I looked at them, I thought, oh Lord, you're in control of every one of them. And not one is colliding, not one is out of control. The billions of stars, he's controlling all that. All at the same time, I thought about all the people on the earth, the billions of people on the earth, that he knows every single thought that we're having in every single moment. Can you imagine a God that big and he's running heaven and controlling everything with not one error anywhere? He knows every sparrow that falls to the ground. He knows every hair that's on our head, which changes daily, right? It's increasing for us men. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But you know, I was just enjoying all that, God's glorious creation and his awesome power. But then he wanted me to see and remember. He had me turn around and I looked at the tunnel we just came out of. And people were falling one after another, after another, after another, back down the tunnel we just came out of. And he wept. Because it's not his desire for anybody to go there. Ezekiel 33, 11 says he has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. And people were falling. And he wanted me to remember that. So I would go and witness and I could not stand feeling. He allowed me to feel a piece of his heart. And it was so overwhelming to feel what God feels. His love, Ephesians 3.19 said, his love passes knowledge. It's way past our ability to even conceive how much he loves us. And I want to share with you quickly a scripture that he opened up to me. Psalms 139, 17 and 18 says, 
David said, your thoughts toward me are all precious. And I suppose if I should count them, they are more than the sands. Now we glibly read over that and say, oh, that's nice. But God opened that up to me and showed me that, you know, if you were, pick, if you were to pick up a handful of sand, granules of sand, there'd be thousands of granules in your hand, right? If each one represented a thought, and I stood here and I said, I took one grain and I said, wow, I love how my wife prays for me all the time. I love how beautiful she is. I love how she prays for others. I love how she loves the Lord. And I went on like this, and you came back three or four hours from now, and I'm still trying to exhaust this amount in my hand. You would think, Bill's really gone over his wife. He is absolutely bananas over her, right? That's just to exhaust this little bit in my hand. Well, God said his thoughts are more than the sands on the whole earth. That's not an exaggeration because God can't exaggerate. Can you imagine every granule is a thought that he has for you and they're all precious. Now can you kind of grasp the idea of how his love passes knowledge? To have that many thoughts for each one of us. He loves us all that much. And so when people think God's mean that he's sending people to hell, they're so wrong. He's not sending anybody to hell. You know, God's not up there saying, oh, this one goes to heaven, this one goes to hell. All of us, above the age of accountability, are already on our way to hell, automatically. You see, God came to get us off that road. And I like what Reinhard Bunke said. He planted a cross right in the middle of that road of all of us going to hell. So all we have to do is look up to that cross and be humble enough to admit we're sinners and call out on God, and He'll save us. That's the God we serve, a loving God that is trying to keep all of us out of hell. You know, God warns us in five different ways I have seen, at least five. Number one, He gives us creation. And in creation, man is without excuse, Romans 1 says. Because when you see creation in God's heavenlies and man and a baby being born, you have to admit there has to be a designer for all this design. There has to be a creator. You're without excuse. God holds you accountable just for that. Number two, he gives you a conscience. Romans 2.15 says we have a conscience. And in our conscience, we're made aware that there is a God. There is a supreme being. And we know that there's right from wrong. That's in our conscience. Number three, he gives us the Bible, the written word. And you know, in real estate, we always look for things in writing. You thought, if you had it in writing, you got it. Well, God gave it to us in writing. 66 books written by 40 authors. He put it in writing and told us exactly how to stay out of hell and how to get to heaven. He gives us evangelists, pastors, teachers. Uh, he gives us radio, TV, uh, missionaries going around the world to witness to people. And then lastly, he gives us, Job 33 says, he gives man dreams and visions to keep back his soul from the pit. He'll even give that person in the remote mountains uh, somewhere, he'll give him a dream or vision. If that person just seeks out and says, God, I know there's a creator. I know there's a God. I want to know you. God will reveal himself to that person. So man is without excuse. We came back down on the earth and came up on my body and I, we were hovering above our, my house, my wife's and I house. And I looked through the roof and I could see myself lying on the floor. It was so strange to look at my body. I thought, that's not me. This is the real me. It looked like if you were to get out of your car. It's just a vehicle to get you around in. It's not really you. That's how temporal the body looked. And then I saw a puff of smoke go up. And I said, Lord, what's that? And he said, your life. I said, that's it? It was over in a second. Well, he said, James 4, 14, life is but a vapor. It was so fast compared to eternity, like a little tea kettle with smoke going up. That's how short our life is compared to eternity. I thought, Lord, we don't have much time. And he said, yeah, but what you do for me during that time, I will count for all eternity. Isn't that awesome that God would do that? <laughs> Praise the Lord. You know, that short time, if we, it gave me a better overall eternal perspective on life. What's important, really? Serving God is most important. All the rest of it's going to pass and burn. It doesn't matter. It won't last. But what you do for God witnessing, getting involved in the church, feeding the poor, uh, preaching the gospel, anything you can do for God, helping, all these people that help around here, all these things are rewards in heaven and will last for all eternity. I'm telling you, it gave me, I thought, Lord, I don't want to waste a second. I want to do everything I can for you. I want to live, eat, and breathe the gospel. And that's how we all should feel. 
because we have the good news, we, we need to go out and tell a dying world about Jesus. He's a good God. We have the words. We have his word. All we have to do is open our mouths. And the Lord said to me, you know, many of my people make excuses why they don't witness. They say, I didn't feel led. And I felt convicted because I've done that. Now, I know we all need to feel led and not be people ahead with the Bible. But so many times we make excuses and say, I didn't feel led, when really we were fearing man rather than fearing God. We need to fear God and, and be obedient to do what he's called us to do. Anyway, you know, you might be here and you might say, but Bill, I'm a good person. I'm not going to go to hell. There was a 2006 Barna poll that showed that 54% of Americans generally believe that if you're a good person, you'll go to heaven, and if you're bad, you go to hell. That's the common misconception because it's not based on being good. It's based on a relationship. You see, and it's a good thing it wasn't based on being good because none of us would get there. You see, you might be pretty good compared to people, but if you're going to go by that standard, you have to compare it to God's good. And God says, if, if you lie once, Revelation 21.8 says, all liars shall have their part in the lake of fire. Just once. If you steal one thing, no thief will inherit heaven. 1 Corinthians 6.9. If you lust just one time, Jesus said that's the same as committing adultery. No adulterer will inherit heaven. Just one time, because James 2.10 says, if you offend the law in one point, you're guilty of all. Well, that's just three of the Ten Commandments. If we're going to be judged by that standard, would we be guilty or innocent? We'd all be guilty, right? That's a pretty high standard. So there's a penalty to pay for our sin. But Jesus paid that penalty. Romans 6.23 says, The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He paid it. You can either let Him pay it or you can. But you see, you could never pay it because it took an eternal God and the blood of Jesus to pay for our sins. Time in hell would never suffice. You can't be in hell for 500 years and say, well, I paid, I worked off my sins. That would be a works trip, number one. And time would never suffice because we're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved by time. And God will not violate his word. His word is forever settled in heaven. So he can't come get you out of hell and someday take you out. No, hell is permanent, it's eternal. We're saved by grace through faith. You know, but you might be like, I was on a radio talk show with um, one of the toughest radio announcers in the country. And they said, Bill, watch your back. This guy hates Christians and he'll just chew you up on the air. It was syndicated across the nation, Chicago, New York, Miami, it was live. It was supposed to be a 10 minute interview. And uh, he started off and he said, all right, first of all, I don't want to hear one Bible verse out of your mouth. Don't you quote the Bible to me over my airwaves. You got that? I said, no problem. And he said, I submit to you that your God is unreasonable and unloving because he doesn't consider my viewpoints, only your Christian's viewpoint. That's unreasonable and unloving. He should let me into heaven because I'm a good person and he should respect my viewpoints. Your God is actually guilty of a hate crime. So what, do you, what have you got to say for yourself? I thought, Lord, what do you say to that? And I can't give scripture, and I love to give scripture, you know. And the Lord gave me an analogy right then. And I said, let me give you an analogy. I said, say you went and knocked on the door of the most expensive home in the country. And you knocked on the door and you said, um, excuse me, I'm moving in with you because I'm a good person. What do you think the people would say? No, right? And you wouldn't expect them to because you have no relationship with them. The same way. You go through your whole life, you have nothing to do with God, you deny that Jesus is the Son of God, then at the end of your life, you come and knock on His door and you say, uh, excuse me, I'm moving in with you. I'm a good person. It's not based on being good. It's based on a relationship. You have to know Him. And He offered Himself to be your Father, but you rejected Him over and over again. He's your Creator, but He's not your Father. Galatians 3.26 uh, Romans 9, 7, and 8, John 1, 12, John 8, 44, all explain that, that he's your creator, but he's not your father until you invite in Jesus into your heart, then he becomes your father. So who's the arrogant one expecting to live at a house where you don't even know the person? You have no right. He says, well, you Christians are narrow-minded. You think you're the only ones that's right. And I said, well, let me give you another analogy. I said, say you invited me over to dinner and you said, Bill, I want you to go south on Highway 95, turn right at Main Street, go up the hill, you'll come to my house. That's the only way to get to my house. And I say to you, you know what? 
I think I'm going to go north on 95. I'm going to get off at Beach Boulevard because I think all roads lead to your house. That's what I think. All right? You're going to say, Bill, I'm trying to give you clear directions to my house. Well, I think God knows where he lives. Right? He's given us clear directions. All we have to do is follow his directions. We'll get there. If we don't, we send ourselves to hell. That's not narrow-mindedness. That's specific. God is specific with his directions. And he said, well, if there's a God, how come there's so much evil in the world? I said, well, if there is no God, how come there's so much good in the world? Amen? Praise God. Where's all this good come from? He said, well, okay, so I'm a sinner. I'm not, that's not, I'm not that bad, though. I don't kill anybody. Can't God overlook my sins? Is what he said to me. I said, no, he can't for two reasons. Number one, he's a just judge. And a good judge in our land would not be considered good if he let the criminal go free, would he? The crime has to be punished. Well, our sin has to be punished. And it was. Jesus took our punishment for us. So again, you can either let him take it or you can take it. But you'd have to pay for it for all eternity because you can never pay for sins. I said, but secondly, the second reason he can't overlook your sin is because Hebrews 12, 29 said God is a consuming fire. And what that means is, say you stuck your hand in the fire to retrieve something and it burned you. You wouldn't say, why did that fire burn me? That was mean in that fire. I didn't do anything to that fire. You wouldn't say that, would you? Why? Because the nature of the fire is to burn. You would expect it to. Your hand and fire are not compatible. Well, the same with God. God and sinful man are not compatible. See, and that's a problem for us. We are sinful. So we can't show up in his presence. We would be consumed because he's a consuming fire. You see that? So how can man ever stand before a holy God? Only one way. We would have to appear to be sinless. Well, how can that happen? Again, only one way. Someone would have to come and live a perfect life and never sin once. And that someone is Jesus. And stand before God and say, I've lived the perfect life. I'm going to exchange their sin for my righteousness. If they would trust in me instead of their works. Titus 3.5 says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So if we would trust in his work and not ours, he takes on our sin and washes away with his blood. And we can now stand there as if we never sinned because our sin is washed away. Isn't that an awesome plan that God came up with? Praise God, he came up with this plan. Thank the Lord. People complain and say, I don't like this one-way business. You ought to be grateful there is a way. Amen? And God made a way. This is the directions to heaven. Okay? John 3.36 says, He that has the Son has everlasting life. But he that has not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. How do you know the Son? Two things. You have to repent of your sin. Luke 13, 3, Jesus said, Unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Repent means to turn away from your sin. Walk away from it. It's not enough to just mentally assent to the fact that Jesus is the Son of God. You have to agree to walk away from your sin and say, Lord, I recognize I am a sinner. I cannot save myself. I don't want to sin anymore. I, I want to walk and follow you if you repent of your sin. And Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. That's the way to heaven. Jesus said in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes unto the Father but by me. And I'm not here to denigrate anyone's belief but I am here to dissuade you from believing anything other than what Jesus just said. He is the only way. There is no other way. I don't care what you were raised with. Jesus, there's one way. One way. But you know, it's your choice. God gives man a choice because that's what love does. It gives a choice. You know, he could have made us robots, but he, he didn't. He gave man that free will so you could choose. One last scripture. Revelation 20, 15 says, Whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. God has a book. And on Judgment Day, if you're not saved, you're going to stand before Him. He's going to open this book. And wouldn't it be a horrible thing to hear Him say, Your name's not in this book. Depart from me into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. 
that would be the worst words you could ever hear because it's eternal. So I want to ask you one question tonight. Do you know if your name is written in his book? If you want your name in God's book, then just repeat this prayer and say it from your heart. Say, Dear God in heaven, I know that I have sinned and I cannot save myself. I believe you sent your son Jesus to die on a cross for me, that he was crucified, died and was buried and rose again. I ask you to forgive me of my sins. I repent. I turn from my sins. I ask you to come into my heart. I receive you as my Lord and Savior. Thank you, Jesus, for shedding your blood to wash away my sins. I believe I am now a born-again Christian going to heaven. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. This was the wisest decision you could ever make. Your spirit is alive to God now, and you are in His family. Now, this is only your first step. There are a couple of things that are really important. First, read your Bible every day, especially the New Testament, because it will change you from the inside out as you begin to do what it says. It is God's instruction manual for life. Second, learn about all that Jesus paid for on the cross. Learn about God's great love and His grace, His power that He's given us to overcome sin, to break addiction and lust over our lives. But it's not automatic. We must do our part by developing our relationship with God. Connect with other believers, get planted in a good church, and cut off ungodly associations so that you won't be pulled back down into your old ways. And always remember, if you mess up in sin, don't ever run away from God. Jesus said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Immediately ask Him to forgive you and run right back to Him. He will help you every time, no matter what. Keep Him first, pursue Him, and you will truly live. Thank you for watching. We really appreciate those who have written to us, who have prayed for us. Thank you all so very much. And we wish we could write every one of you back. We truly appreciate your kind words and your prayers. And we pray and hope that you all can be soul winners. God bless you.